Welcome to another episode of Wild and Exposed, your wildlife photography and outdoor adventure podcast. This week, your hosts are Michael Morrow, Ron Hayes, and myself, Mark Raycroft. I'd like to welcome Tim Irvin to the podcast. I'm excited to have this conversation with Tim today. I've known him at a distance for a little over a year. I've been following him on Instagram. We have a couple of friends in common. I enjoy his work, his perspective on life, his outdoors, adventure, personality. Tim is a talented photographer and naturalist and is the founder and head guide of Wildlife Journeys, specializing in bears and wolves of the Great Bear Rainforest. So Tim, when did the spark come or the connection to get you into the Great Bear Rainforest? Where did that project initiate from? You know, that, that was just, sometimes you just never know where life is going to take you, right? And, and it really was a series of coincidences. I was, I'd finished my degree in biology. I was working as a field biologist. I'd been doing studies of birds and uh, even squirrels. I'd spent several months tracking lynx through, the, through northern Maine, doing a study of lynx there. And I'd been hopping from contract to contract. And then I just happened to have a friend of a friend call me and said, hey, uh, there's this grizzly bear lodge on the West Coast, and, and they like to have biologists work as guides there. Would you be interested in that sort of thing? And, of course, like immediately, you know, the, the hair stood up on the back of my neck when they, they, they explained to me, that, hey, there's, you know, like 40, 50 bears using this estuary and, and, and the surrounding area. And, uh, you know, you, your job is to take people out and explain natural history to them and set them up so they can take pictures of bears chasing salmon and I thought you, you're, kid, you're you're like that. That's a job. You can you can you can, that's a th- you can do that. You know, it's like you know, your, your your high school guidance counselor doesn't you know tell you that that's an option, right? <laughs> and so anyway, the the answer was yes. I would be interested in that, and I managed to talk myself into a job at that was Night at Lodge, and that was in two thousand and three, I think. And uh, so so it was just it wasn't a place that was on my radar. I mean, I'd heard of the Great Bear Rainforest. But it seemed so distant and so exotic as to be out of reach. So it wasn't like there was a spark and I chased it. It was just that um, I got perhaps the luckiest break of my life. Yeah. It's great one. That's pretty awesome. Take yeah. it. That is, and that is the gift that, that keeps on giving. I mean, it, I can't tell you how extraordinarily fortunate I feel to have got that job and then everything that's come from it, you know, because it is such an extraordinary part of the world. Can we you talk just... about that a lot because it's the same for me. I didn't, the mm-hmm. guidance counselor didn't tell me you could be a photographer. <laughs> of course not. But, and know, if they knew, that... they would have warned you against it, right? <laughs> well, that's probably true too. But then when I found out, I was like, huh, maybe I'll give that a go. Yeah. No, good for you. I, I wish I'd known that earlier. You know, I, I wish I'd, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but the obstacle for me with photography, like I didn't, when I first started guiding, I didn't even have a camera. Well, that's not true. I had a Canon AE-1 and a 28 to 85 lens, I think. Uh, Not so awesome for shooting grizzly bears. But um, I was always frightened away by the expense of photography. So, you know, for the first number of years I was guiding, I just kept on being like I was a field biologist and taking notes everywhere I went. I didn't take any pictures at all. But uh, eventually, you know, bought a third hand Canon 10 D and a second hand, you know, hundred to 400 lens and got started. But did you just jump right in Michael or what, what did you do? Uh, same thing. You start with just really crappy stuff, right? Yeah, because you just yeah. can't afford it. You think you can't afford it and you can't actually, I couldn't. It yeah, was a very yeah. minimal setup, but at least get you out there and you, you get exposed to it. And totally. then everything you do from that point forward is always a quest to make better pictures, which, is part of the equipment and then part of the behavior and Mm. just everything leads to that. But it it took, it took a long time, you know, many odd jobs and many different things before you can actually make a living at it. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I remember hearing a story of Paul Nicklin. He he was working some horrible manual labor job to save up for his first underwater housing. I think he was still in university and he, he finally, saved up enough money and he got it. He went down to, he was living in Victoria at the time and he went down to the shore and put his camera in there and stuck it underwater and he hadn't sealed it up properly and he fried his camera. Oh, I know. <laughs> yeah, and it was like weeks and weeks of just toiling at some manual labor job, you know, and everybody's got 
some version of a story like that. But that, that was a, must have been a particularly painful one. Yeah. But clearly Paul persevered, like many of us do, and, and yeah. exceedingly well with his career, <laughs> too. Sure. Yeah. Just for some of our listeners that may not know where the Great Bear Rainforest is located, can you describe that? Just a dialogue. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a great, we're, we're getting ahead of ourselves here. So the Great Bear Rainforest, if you haven't been, it's coastal temperate rainforest as opposed to tropical rainforest. And it's located, uh, if you picture, uh, it's a, just a thin strip along the west coast of British Columbia. And it stretches from, at the north end, from Alaska, all the way down to just about, uh, just about halfway down Vancouver Island, except on the mainland. So it's a, the mainland forest that stretches from about midway from Vancouver Island up to uh, Alaska. And it's, it's the big, you know, people always say it's the biggest piece of intact temperate rainforest uh, left in the world. And, and that's, I mean, it's a very special ecotype anyway, because, you know, it only covered less than 1% of the entire planet to begin with before we started cutting it down. Uh, and so that's what makes it particularly special is that it's relatively intact compared to other parts of the world where this forest type exists. Well, what an opportunity to share that with people to take them out and expose them to it and educate them about it. There's something I read that was quite interesting about you that I didn't realize there were these certifications to be certified as a level three bear viewing guide by the Commercial Bear Viewing Association of British Columbia. What's mm -hmm. the difference between a level one, two, three bear viewing guide? Yeah, I think it's mostly, it's funny because when I, when I, when they started that, the bear viewing industry was starting to grow and they realized that, hey, if, if we don't sort of regulate ourselves, somebody's going to regulate us. And so we should create our own certification program. So at first it was just, you, you took a course and, or you were grandfathered in. I was grandfathered in cause I've already been guiding for a number of years uh, before they <clears throat> started doing this more officially. And at first it was just a simple um, certification. You were certified or you weren't. And then I think they realized that, you know, there's a lot of difference between somebody who's a first year guide and somebody who's 10 or 15 or 20 years into it. So I think level three uh, essentially becomes your number of years for a uh, number of years working in the field, um, running an operation, and uh, um, and essentially comes down to how much interaction you've had with bears. Right. Yeah. Well, how do you get, so is there a process to get that certification, or it's more just proving your experience? And there, there is. I mean, you, you have to, and again, I, I'm not exactly the right person to ask, because again, I was grandfathered in. So um, I see, okay. there, there is a course you take, and then I think what you do is you submit your hours. Uh, if you're employed at a particular lodge or with some sort of bear being operation, you submit your hours. Uh, and, and I can't speak to any greater detail than that because uh, I, I don't actually know. I should probably sure. find out. <laughs> well, no, but that makes sense. If you were grandfathered in, I, I just never <laughs> realized that there were these levels of certification. So I was just purely curious what that required. It's, it's good that it exists, I'm sure. Yeah. But, oh, it's it's, no. it's great. It's great that it exists just because it, it creates a standard where everybody's speaking the same language and you you have a faith. You can you know that you, when somebody goes to British Columbia to work with a bear guide as a photographer, just a nature buff, you know that they have somebody who at least has a baseline understanding of bear behavior and ecology and, how, and human bear interactions. Mm -hmm. And that's really critical if we want to keep this a safe industry. And it's an extremely safe industry. And those of us, you know, on this call, we understand that perfectly well. But uh, for people on the outside, and again, I think we tend to forget because we live in this bubble where we understand really well that we can get along well with bears. But I, 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 and I was thinking about this the other day. I think we forget that on the outside, uh, a lot of people are still scared of bears and, and are not trusting. And so I think it's important that we have this standard of uh, practice um, within the bear being industry just to make sure that uh, we stay safe and that um, the industry has a good name. Yeah, I think when... You know, especially in the lower 48, the Yellowstone ecosystem, mm. there's a lot of uh, misinformation out there mm -hmm. about about the bears and about being around bears. Mm. And I think the issue is, especially in, in my area, it, the only thing you ever hear about is the negative interaction. Is that right? Whether, mm. whether it's, you know, on the bear side or on the on the person's side, you know, I think you could take every interaction or every negative interaction back to human behavior. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's unfortunate that that's all you hear about. And, and so we try to educate people, you know, about just the opportunity to be around bears and as well as be around bears safely for, for the bear and for the individual. And I think, you know, you're talking about a very unique area and obviously we're going to get into that. And there's a couple other areas in Alaska uh, that are very unique and is 
the amount of interaction with those bears and uh, the time the bears are used to to having the people around as well Mm -hmm. and i think let me just add on to that because i think in addition to what you said ron i think the other thing is is and i used to get this request all the time for stills and i get it for video now if somebody's looking for some footage they want a grizzly bear growling yeah, or they want this massive pose, and it's like, right. mm, you know what? I've been doing this for a long time, and I've seen a lot of bears, and I don't see that too much, unless it's yeah. a bear against bear. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, very seldom do you see that behavior, and but that's what the media wants because they want that shock value to to hype mm-hmm. it up, and I think it's just so wrong. It's interesting too because I notice even in wildlife documentaries, obviously in Hollywood films, but even in wildlife documentaries, they often insert uh, bears making sounds, grunting, groaning, roaring, and stuff that. I never hear bears do that. You know, it's like, (laughs) it it happens all the time. And and, I mean, I understand they're trying to engage an audience and tell a story. And and sometimes you you need to do that, you know, uh, to keep things ticking along. But uh, it is a little frustrating sometimes because very frustrating. Yeah. Like Ron was saying, it's like, you know, we're, we're trying to educate people. And and to me, the the common theme here is just trying to sort of reconstruct this um, or improve the human relationship with nature. And bears are, I think, a neat way to to bridge that because there is so much inbred fear there, but there's just so much potential for the relationship to be a positive one. Oh, I've got a few things I can spin on that. I'll start mm-hmm. with my dad. He mm-hmm. was totally fearful of bears. And mm-hmm. I took him on a few black bear photography trips, week long trips with me. And he turned from fear. Like the first time I took him uh, was on a <clears throat> place kind of halfway between where you and I live. Mm-hmm. And there was this road, we had a gated road, we walked down to where these bears were coming out. And when mm-hmm. we hit behind this mound of dirt, I had, I was just starting out, I had an old 400, 5, 6, I was just finishing university, but I'd been exposed enough to bears not to run and be frightful. Yeah. And be respectful with distance and so on. So we're behind this mound of dirt in a clearing, my dad's behind me, and this huge black bear boar comes out on the other side, still close to 100 yards away, mm-hmm. and steps out from the forest edge. And I hear something behind me. I look over my shoulder. And my dad, who was not a young man, was gone. (laughs) And I'm looking. And and he's he's running as fast as he can run. I mean, this is why we went in there, was to see these bears. But he was so uncomfortable. So I'm like, okay, the situation has changed. The bear saw somebody run. I'm just going to leave now and let things settle down. So I grabbed my tripod, walked out the few hundred yards back to where we'd parked. And I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, (laughs) He's like, that bear was huge, and you are way faster than me. I'm getting it. Like, <laughs> so then, so then wow. he traveled with me on a couple of photo trips, and he just, within a year or two, just loved bears and loved nothing more than watching them. We had uh, an opportunity where we would go, where there was a lot of bear activity of all different ages, and there was yeah. uh, spring mating behavior, the cubs and trees, and, mm-hmm. and he was able to witness all of that interaction and appreciate how intelligent the species is and, and really associate with them, really see some of his own personality in some ways, and he loved bears from then on. Mm-hmm.